Okay, so we'll get uh, go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming. This is our second of the uh, uh, the event we have for this week in the uh, International Forum on Youth. And uh, uh, before I introduce the speaker for today, uh, Dr. Uh, Jai has an announcement for you. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay, yes. we are recording and we are live streaming this um, on Facebook. So because we realize many people actually continue to view our recording for different years, month and years to come. So we want to make sure that we have a good um, system so people can hear us. My name is Jai Chin Living. I'm the Dean of International Affairs and Global Engagement at College of Kenyans. Thank you so much for attending in person and for those of you who are attending online will be viewing in the near future. Um, College of Kenyans is really, we, we start to believe in multiple voices and diversity voices. And International Forum on Youth is um, coming from faculty's idea a few years ago that we believe that we want to listen to the youth to see what they have vision for what the future can be, what kind of future they want. And I want to publicly acknowledge our call, uh, faculty co-leaders, Dr. Brent Riffo and Dr. Sal Matsubuto for their tireless work in helping organize. This is our fourth year having international forum on you. And then I also want to thank, of course, uh, the director of program, Dr. Tana Dale, and our wonderful staff, where we have song and we have our house assistant here. And this, I mean, I don't want to take too much away from Dr. Backley's time, but I would like you to know that ISP, the International Service and Program as a department, we work for mobilities in both ways. Not only do we try to attract international students come to study college of Kenyans, we also have multiple university partnerships that we now have exchange student programs. For those students who are interested, domestic students interested in one semester education abroad to, let's say, Prague, Japan, or many, many other places such as London, we now have tuition free exchange programs with those universities. So I would encourage you to look for emails that come from COC Global or ISP. Sometimes we try to push out to Associate Student Government Channel. But if you don't get those emails, please feel free to come to the ISP office or right next to campus security. I just want to make sure that that message is out. Yesterday, when we have a speaker who is Zoom in from London, that's the university we now have exchange program with, and they are in the process of getting a full right scholarship for our students to study in. So a lot, a lot of exciting things are happening. And we believe it's been a way with Dr. Bakis going to give today will also help our students to decide, you know, what do I want to do? Who am I? How do I become the person I want to be so I can contribute for the betterment of the society? Without further ado, I'm going to bring back uh, Dr. Samasabudo. And thank you so much for being here. And for those of you who are viewing this video in the future, thank you for being part of the movement for our view. Thank you. So uh, thank you for introducing me who is going to introduce the speaker today. <laughs> uh, I'm here to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kathy Baki, uh, who is the Dean of Health Professions and Public Safety Division here at College of Canyon. And uh, she has two degrees in economics as well as a doctorate in education leadership, educational leadership. Uh, basically, her journey sort of reminded me of my own because I started as an exchange student, sort of an immigrant student here uh, in, the, in the United States, learning English in the uh, ESL class. Um, Dr. Baki started her uh, journey um, back, um, let's see, started in the ESL class at Mount San Antonio College. That's the one next to California, if I'm wrong. Yeah. In the LA yeah, area. Yes. Yeah. Um, having started as an immigrant, mother, part-time student, she moved uh, quickly from being an adjunct staff, later full-time, a tenure faculty, and a college administrator while raising three children who have gone on to earn their own professional degrees. She knows what it takes to achieve success. She firmly believes that, educational, that education transforms lives and expands the 
range of opportunities for you students. The uh, title of her talk will be Life and College Planning, a Holistic Approach, Explore Current Consideration and People Take When Making Career and Major Decisions. So let me, um, well, you can uh, welcome our speaker, Dr. Baki. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Saab. Uh, I'm so excited to uh, be with you today. And um, I'm going to try and contain myself because I do two things. I talk fast and I move. And now I'm tied to this mic. So I might forget myself and start moving. And so bear with me you know, as we go through this. I am uh, I'm excited because um, I have been contemplating uh, this topic for a while. And um, it, it started you know, when I was an adjunct teaching economic, uh, economics classes and trying to figure out how do I help my students be successful. When you're 18, 19 years old and you're learning about the Federal Reserve System and it's just not happening, not clicking for you, <laughs> you get bored and you lose interest and you move on. And so over for the past 30 years, I've been asking the question of how do I help uh, students be successful or you know, be more successful if they're already somewhat successful. And, and so um, I've accumulated a lot of uh, thoughts and I, I like keep scrapbooks like, you know, notes here and there. And, and um, in the past few months, I put them together uh, to offer some insight. And I hope that you find it helpful. What you're going what, what to hear today is more of a, a framework. How should I think when it comes to the topic of should I do with my life? What career should I get into? What major should I choose? And, and, and again, what motivated me is seeing young people, my nephews and nieces, like I have a whole bunch of them, struggling with that direction. Should I uh, go to kinesiology and, and um, you know, health programs or should I go in the arts? Because that's what my calling is. And what if, what if I can't pay my bills if I go into the arts? How do we answer these questions? Or you hear in the media all the time, you know, passion, passion, passion. What if you don't have a passion? What are you supposed to do? So today I'm going to be presenting a framework of how to think about these topics. And um, so huh, here we go with the movement. Uh, okay. Great. <clears throat> um, I move, I use the mouse. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Oh, you do. Yeah, you just do tell it? me next slide. Okay. All right. So um, I want to. I people shared uh, my background, <laughs> and so and so uh, I'm gonna just uh, say quickly that uh, by all means. Stop me anytime, mid sentence, mid work. I don't care because I want to hear from you. I want to answer your questions. I want this to be useful. And so, again, by the end of this conversation, we're going to hopefully share that framework and also um, explore it from a traditional, you know, perspective. What, a, how has you know humanity lived for for a couple hundred thousand years versus our world today, and and uh, what are current considerations people uh, think about when it comes to uh, college and career planning, and again, propose that comprehensive uh, framework. So on the next slide, uh, just one click, please. Um, I want you to pay attention to the questions that are gonna come up, and I want you to mark the questions that uh, are most on your mind, and if any of you cares to share them by talking or raising your hand or shouting them out, go for it. So one click each question, please. Go ahead. Continue. <laughs> Let me try this. Okay, I think it was okay. So those are the questions.
where should I apply for college or what's the best four year big name college I should go to? What is the best major I, I should go into? What is my passion? Like I mentioned the second ago, um, if I go into the major that I'm not necessarily passionate about, we don't like it. Um, what will my parents or my, um, my peers think of my choice? Are they gonna tell me uh, that, you know, you've worked all these years to major in what, you know? Um, how am I gonna pay for it? How will my parents pay for it, potentially? <laughs> will I make enough money when I graduate? Um, how will it, how, or when will I be able to actually work? Like if you go to med school, you're talking about like 10, 12 years of education before you, actually make something above minimum wage. <laughs> um, and and where, what state or country? Often we hear students going to out of state. I want to go out of state outside, you know, away from my parents. Um, <laughs> because they, they're trying to figure out who they are. And they, they want to get out of the shadow of the parents. Um, will I be able to work and support myself through school? And, you know, what's get, who, who do I leave behind? What about my friends? So these are uh, questions. Um, shout out, raise your hand, tell me what question resonates most with you. Oops, what's going on here? Any, anyone? Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, I, me, the number three is really interesting. I, I, I didn't have passion. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, please. Number two. Uh, 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 number two, which is, can you repeat? Is it the best major choice? Best major choice. Can you take this out, please? Because I need to move. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, six, what would people think about it? Yes, please. Um, number seven. Can you afford it? So I'm so glad to hear you because you're validating my observations about, about the student experience. And so with that, you know, you can see that things are pretty complicated and, um, you know, people long for some clarity and because they're feeling overwhelmed and they want to they wanna make the right thing. They don't want to be frozen. What I hear from people is that I'm not ready to commit because I want to make sure it's the right thing and I'm frozen here and I can't, you know, I don't want to make the wrong move. And so what I'm going to offer you in the next few slides uh, is a perspective on, on how, you know, let's just step away for a minute and see how things evolve over time. Today, we live in an apps world. Um, how, many, how many apps do you have uh, on your phone? On your cell phone, many. too many. Wh which ones do you use uh, for entertainment most, or searching? Go ahead, speak up. Don't be afraid. Google, TikTok, Netflix, Disney Plus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I use a lot of YouTube. Um, that's my education slash entertainment when I'm bored. And, and so on average, folks, people have 40 to 60 apps on their cell phones. We live in a world of Bitcoin, quantum uh, entanglement, uh, and, and, and uh, whoops, <laughs> I'm not being able to see it, and, and a uh, blockchain kind of situation where people are living on the edge. But I propose that things have not always been this way. As a matter of fact, um, humanity has been on Earth for, you know, probably millions of years, but in the past 200,000 uh, years, um, we, we know that there is uh, some documented history of the human experience. And so um, the picture here captures how people live just a couple hundred thousand years ago. Can you um, can you describe anyone describe what's what they see in the picture? What 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 can you conclude about the you know the human experience from looking at the slide? Yes, please. Sleep, food, and 
Simple life, okay. No technology, yes. Yes. Limited options. Limited options, yes. You're outside. Outside, mm hmm. Keep going. They're harvesting. They're harvesting, working um, in a group. There is uh, like manual labor, physical labor. Some are tired. Um, yes. Very close to nature and sharing food as a as a group. And and you know, what do you know compare that for a second with the cell phone experience today? Right? It's it's, it's a huge contrast. Ladies and gentlemen, um this experience, the, the change to um the change has happened only. Um, in the past 250 years. This is not working. It's really concerning. It's, it's frozen. I apologize. Please bear with me. Nothing is mm -hmm. connecting. I don't know if it's a battery issue. Okay. Oh, it's because I moved that thing. Okay. Well, now it is. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so looking back again, um, only in the past 250 uh, years did humanity experience so much uh, change. And as a matter of fact, um, if you look at, if you look at um, in the 1970s, uh, sorry, 1770s, uh, through the 1840s, that's when we had the first industrial uh, revolution and since then now they're calling them first, second, third, and and fourth. And you see the periods there, the the gaps um, or or extension of time, I should say. And and currently we are living the fourth industrial uh, revolution. And and this all happened because of the um, the 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 combustion and not the combustion, the the steam engine. Uh, that was developed in the uh, early 1770s um, into the early 1800s. And, and so transformed us from having um, manual labor to mechanical labor. And, and again, look at, look at what you see here. Um, you, again, you went from having people working uh, with, using their muscles with uh, small towns, where people went to town uh, to, um, to trade their crafts. And uh, notice, uh, oops, uh, notice the um, family in the right hand, uh, the, the, the corner right there, uh, where um, the family, including the kids working on the farm. So the, the family was the center of the universe. People stuck together, limited transportation, limited travel, and limited technology. And then, you go to um, uh, before, sorry, uh, the occupations, focusing on the occupations for a second. Occupations were limited. A lot of people working, worked in agriculture. Uh, hours were long. And again, mostly handcrafts and local shops is where they, the trades took place. The purpose of work was to survive, you know, because you didn't have very many options. You needed to survive. And so that struggle for survival provided clarity for people. Like, you know, I got to figure things out because I need to survive. And so it was harsh, but it was uh, clear. And <laughs> people did not obsess about what is my passion. And so in the past 50 years, that change has accelerated tremendously with the creation of the transistor, which is, you know, um, electrical units that allow us to uh, transmit information and, and electricity and the uh, creation of the computer chips. And uh, just in 1969, which is a little over 50 years ago, that uh, the first internet message was um, sent out at, through a university campus. And, and so the technology, the change in technology has touched every aspect of our lives. Um, the steam engine allows for, allows for uh, freight, mechanical machines, the automobiles, telecommunications, 
fertilizers, petroleum, telegraph, all that changed as a result of um, the, the improvement in, in the steam engine and improvement in technology over time. It also allowed for uh, specialization. Uh, people needed to specialize. I need to go to college to get a major because I need to specialize in something and sell my labor and earn a, uh, an income. People traveled a lot more. The world is small. Uh, Jari just came back from a long trip around the world. <laughs> and, and then um, as a result of that, now we have so many more occupations. Uh, the number of people working in agriculture dr uh, dropped dramatically. Why would production actually increase dramatically? So that's a huge um, change. Now we talk about data science, blockchain, digital, mar digital marketing, user experience design, uh, search engine optimization are key uh, new fields that young people can specialize in. And what, if you look on YouTube, it's all about life. I don't need to go to college to earn a degree. I can just be an entrepreneur and I can make it on my own because there are opportunities to um, get rich fast. And so that changed also touched the family, it impacted the family. The family unit, um, you know, it used to be that everything revolved around the family. And now uh, people are more, um, you know, somewhat disconnected, the dynamic is different because you don't need to rely on the family as much. There is so much more knowledge and support outside of the family. And some people, you know, rightfully so, I feel that this is a um, maybe a negative impact of the, you know, technology on our lives and the family life, but it is, it is for sure the true experience. And I want to highlight, because we are an international program, um, you know, the, the different perspectives around the world, because not everybody thinks the same way. Um, you know, they're in the West. Uh, the push is that, okay, you're 18 years old, you need to figure yourself out, um, you know, get out and get an education, get a job and, and you know, make your life happen. And, and you have to figure it out. You know, you, you are in charge, you'll figure it out. But in the Eastern perspective is that there is much more expectation for involvement, that the parents and the family continues to have a conversation uh, with the children around, okay, well, you know, I don't think you should specialize in that or you should major in that because it uh, might not be um, competitive, you're not getting paid well, whatever, X, Y, Z concerns. How are you gonna pay for it? You need to get out and get a job because we need you to help support the family. The, the scenarios are, uh, or possibilities are endless. And so that, um, the revolution also impacted, oops, impacted higher education because in, with higher education, uh, in 1940, only 6% of the population had uh, bachelor's degrees. Um, in 2010, it was 26%, uh, oops, and uh, uh, the current data, I don't know why it's not showing up, but currently it's at uh, higher than that, I think like 36%. Um, it's, that part is deleted somehow. Anyhow, so another major impact of the um, Industrial Revolution post is the amount of information we're, we're bombarded with. Like, you know, so uh, 18 years old, images and data coming at you in the thousands daily and you're trying to focus and figure out who you are what you want to be and what you're feeling and, and reflect on your thoughts and all that stuff and so no wonder people are feeling overwhelmed and confused it's hard it is hard being a young person and trying to figure out even and i am look i am over 50 i'm 56 to be specific and and um you know I had um, a life move changing situation a few years ago, and I was thinking to myself these same things. Okay, what should I do with my life now? And, and it was overwhelming for me having studied economics and lived 50 years. So let alone uh, a young person. And so um, for the first time, people, again, given all this change, People are asking, what should I do with my life? What should I be when I grow up? Or now we have the, the great resignation, right? A lot of people because of COVID left their jobs and, and they decided, I don't wanna do the, the corporate world and work nine to five and not see my family, I wanna do other things. And so with that, okay, what should I do with my life? The same question and the same framework still applies. 
And so what I'm gonna offer you now is some thoughts to guide your thinking process. And the good news, here's the good news. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> it, I mean, to me, this is big. You, you know, don't stress so much, don't be too hard on yourself. And I'll show you why I think that way. And, and I wanna take, again, your questions. No, you're wrong, you, you know. I have a concern and here it is. I wanna hear from you. So there are things that did not change, ladies and gentlemen. And those are human nature. Like technology accelerated so much, but we're still people. And so of course we are gonna strive to be happy. You know, this whole confusion, what should I do? I wanna make the right decision because I'm trying to maximize my happiness. Not only that, but actually, when I used to teach economics, I teach sales periodically. Um, the basis for the whole economic theory is that we are rational human beings, and we're supposed to compare the benefits and the costs of things and make the best decision for ourselves. So we're constantly like, this is now ingrained in people. I want to find the best price. I want to find the best deal. I want to find best X, Y, Z. And so there is that drive to, you know, but ultimately at the bottom of it all is that we're trying to be happy. Okay. Um, number two, human nature. Fear is a bigger motivator than, than joy or, or positive reinforcement. We are afraid of failure. We're afraid to make a mistake. I was afraid to put this presentation together because I don't want to look like a fool. <laughs> uh, and so it's real. It's real. And so um, you have to put yourself out there and be brave about things sometimes. Oh, you should have seen when I was brave and I was um, trying to speak after arriving to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the first month or two months when people would come and, and visit and you know they couldn't speak and so I had to stop and say ask my husband how do you say this word in English how do you say that word in English it was just a constant struggle so you have to be brave and try new things um the psychology of approval um by family and friends especially family is so important and peers um it's extremely important we're still seeking you know you know we can achieve the biggest thing in the world the biggest degree the biggest job the biggest whatever but if our family and our friends don't approve of us we feel that something is missing and so we're seeking that approval and that's obviously now social media plays into it and and we're hoping again constantly to uh, get that approval uh, through social media which contributes to the stress like i said uh, so here are additional guiding thoughts this is a big one. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time. And I'm sorry, there is so much text. Usually I don't put this much text on the slides <laughs> and I add more images and, and maybe engagement, but um, I didn't want to wander. There's so much to wander to in these slides. And so my way of containing myself is to put it here in text and highlight what's important. Why do we need to explore uh, identity? The best uh, uh, analogy I heard in terms of understanding identity is like identity is like the software to our computer. It's the operating system. It's, it's, it runs in the background. You don't know it's running, but it's running. And, and it controls, no, I shouldn't say control. It drives, um, it drives your emotions, your thoughts, and your choices. And so it is so important for you to um, try and figure out, okay, you know, what's my identity? So you ask the question, what's an identity? Identity touches on the question of who we are. And, and there are many things we can include in who we are. We can include, you know, uh, gender, age, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultural heritage, language, height, uh, preferences, all sorts of stuff. But the most important thing in it all, and here's another, another analogy, is the pit to the avocado. <laughs> what is in the core that is, um, that's driving to, to come out? What's at your core? And, and so that is uh, really important for you to consider. Cultural norms and family, especially at a young age, sometimes a traumatic experience, will um, drive your identity. Let me give you an example. Um, 
I, my, I come from a family of 10, and my father um, had a, a sixth grade education. My mother had a third grade education. And um, at some point, when my father was trying to earn a living, he left um, agricultural work and, and uh, picked up a job, part of the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> and picked up a job as a driver for a uh, person of higher statue in the royal court um, overseas, and in Jordan specifically. And so uh, one day, um, somebody contacts my father from the townspeople and says, um, you know, you know this high person with authority, can you ask them to help our son get a job, any job? And so this person asked, uh, okay, tell me what can they do? Like, you know, who can use their skills? And they say, hmm, not much. They don't have much education or skills or training. And so the, the royal court person looks at my father and says, go tell all your relatives to get an education. Family of 10, I, I have a, the doctor and we have three engineers, including two female engineers in a developing country um, and um, masters my brother runs um, the uh, telecommunications arm for the Middle East for French Telecom. So, so the education, you talk about identity, we started to identify as we are gonna get an education. That's an identity you know, example. What happened in your history that tells you, you are X, Y, Z, you're smart, you're good in math, you're good in, in science, you're good in arts, you're, you're, you're quiet, you're shy, you're strong, you're aggressive. And notice also, I want to also touch on how we use language to imply different things. Because if you describe a woman, for example, as being aggressive, that has a negative connotation compared to um, describing a man. You know, historically aggressive men are well, strong and aggressive women are looked at as, you know, um, too much, overwhelming. They need to un, un feminine, unlike you know a woman to to be like that. So, uh, in, in identity again, extremely important. And the impact of social media on forming identity is growing. So, I want to give you an opportunity now to talk. We talk so much. Can anyone, uh, or or maybe on your notebooks? Um, find or write down five words that or phrases that describe your identity. What were driving factors in defining who you are? And do you know how that came about? And if you if you want to share, by all means, I would love to hear your story. I was vulnerable and shared my story. <laughs> Yes, please. Okay. Yes. And I I'm gonna have to share it. <laughs> uh, it came I came as a refugee. Okay. As well. Uh -huh. But the main thing was like, I had to take a responsibility of my younger brother when taken our country. So so you're going to be asked to repeat so people online can hear you. And I heard you say the identity is brave. And the reason is, can you repeat? Uh, I came to states as a refugee. Yes. Uh, and that is not something that I would consider myself brave. But the fact that I have to become a parent at a very young age and bring my little brother with me, that was a challenge and being a parent is in a young age and not being ready it mm -hmm. was a great challenge and I feel like I was brave enough to not give up and do the struggle escaping from one country to the other and wow. from the other one to the other until I made it here. Wow and now he's grown up he's been living with me um went to college and he is helping me right now. Uh, with everything in life. So I feel like going through struggle and being brave makes you strong. So just that word is not something that would be your identity. And there's a lot more that would add to it after. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm so grateful for your participation. 
Okay, anyone else cares to share? Go for it, you can do this. <laughs> okay, so, so this is an exercise that you can continue because obviously this is, you know, it takes you months and years to figure that out, <laughs> to figure out what are major experiences in my childhood and, and my value system that, or, or my family environment, friends, a value system that impacted um, me. Um, I want to share that, um, especially today, it is um, more possible than ever to change your identity. Because we remember what I said earlier, identity you know, drives your thoughts, your emotions, and your decisions. And so please don't feel that you're stuck in your identity. You can change your identity. And here are uh, four phrases that I, I heard um, once. I don't really know who the author is, so forgive me. <laughs> don't mean to steal your work, but they are extremely powerful. Uh, it says, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, and your habits become your new identity. And, and so if you feel that you were, you know, stuck in a certain identity in the past, you don't have to be stuck in that anymore. Another major, major idea is there is not one best answer. Whoever tells you there's one best answer, I am convinced, given my experience and knowledge, uh, that they are wrong. Because um, look at where you are. Uh, hypothetically, you're born at the very beginning. Let me see if I can uh, move out here so I can use a pointer. Uh, do we have a pointer? Yes, we do. So you are born here. And you take uh, any one of those, those paths, you decide on this green one, and now you're here. Look how many paths are possible. You know, the world is different. We're not stuck in a one path, one formula to live your life. In a way, we're so fortunate to have all these possibilities. Um, so, so again, uh, there's not one best answer. And once you decide, if you decide to change your identity, then uh, you can have more possibilities even. The other thing I wanna share is that the landscape is changing so much. Um, lot, like technology is changing, new jobs are being uh, created. And so I used to teach my, my students, by the time you, you um, live a lifetime, you can have five to seven um, careers. So expect that you, that's gonna happen to you. You know, you might think that I'm going to do this, but switch and then switch again. Uh, so that's going to happen. And so to think that with all these options that I'm going to study each and every one and maximize my, my um, decision here and figure out what's the best option, it's going to be too hard. You know, um, start, limit your, your options and start with something and stick with it. The other thing I want to add is that, again, we... We don't want to quote unquote waste time and waste resources and all that stuff. And again, as an economist, I would worry about wasting time and, and wasting resources, especially if you're, you know, refugee or coming from ESL classes or first generation or lower income, uh, you know, populations. You you worry about these things, but again, don't stress too much because if you feel, and I'm not saying you be reckless, and I'll explain in a minute. Whatever decision you make and you gain education experience in, it becomes part of your stock of knowledge. You could use it somewhere else. And going back to the idea of not being reckless, I will show you the model that I, I'm thinking you should follow in making your decision. Because again, you don't want to be reckless. You want to think and you want to analyze what I can. But don't worry too much that you're making a mistake because this becomes part of your stop with knowledge. Guiding thoughts, there's no, we need to change our um, terminology, our language. There's no uh, failure. You, you take the feedback and you change direction. Here's another reality around college majors. 30% of the students enter without major and 70% who think that they selected something, they change their minds. It's because it's too hard to figure out who you you are and what you want to be when you're 17, 18, 19 years old. 
And, and here's another key important piece of information. Gather the feedback and ask the question, okay, what's next? Sometimes you're not gonna get clarity down to 10 years, seven years from now. It's gonna be foggy, it's gonna be ambiguous. Focus on now. Okay, look, here's the direction I'm going into, but in this moment, what's next? What's the next step for me? Here's another happy news. The research on happiness, this is part of why, um, you know, technology change is not always <laughs> negative, even though sometimes people talk about it in a negative way, because it allowed us to uh, gain insight that otherwise we may not gain. This research on happiness was done across the world, across cultures, across uh, ages, across income levels, rich, poor, and they ask people, how's it going? Are you happy? And there is a pattern. And, and the good news is that you will be happy. Likely, you will struggle when you're younger. There is gonna be a period, and again, let me um, move over here, so maybe I can point it to you while I'm speaking here. There is a period when you're younger where you're gonna be struggling um, and your happiness level is gonna decline. Life is challenging. There you have to deal with stuff. You have to work hard. But then things start to, you know, uh, like brighten up and, and improve. And, and uh, again, when they ask people, what are the things that contribute most to your happiness? They are not the things that cost you most. They, it's, it's having a sense of community, having friends, uh, a, a support system, and giving and, and, and helping others. And, and so if you're, you know, if you want to improve your mood, get out of your head and get out and do something to help someone. And that will, will make you happy. Again, the research um, shows that. And the world, if you look at, like we are, uh, in, you know, ISP global program, um, the world is full of problems, whether it's poverty or, or the wars or the water problem, or whatever it is, you know, trash problem. The world is full of problems. Pick one and, and see what you can help uh, with. And so life, again, is a journey, but planning helps. And so this is the piece about planning. Okay, I can't control everything, but there are th certain things I can do for sure. In terms of major selection, you want to change your paradigm. Don't go, I'm going to go to Rhode Island for this college. Uh, don't think I'm going to go out of state or out of the country. Think instead, you know, what is the ultimate career I want to get into? And start with that career path in mind. Here is based on the bits and pieces of information I've gathered over the years. Here's what I propose in terms of a comprehensive planning model. Look at this. So um, I start here at the values, and this is why I um, took the time to talk about identity earlier, because your values drive from your identity. And extremely important because it determines what is it you're trying to accomplish, what's your purpose. Uh, can, can anyone share with us a few words to, uh, to describe values or their values? I'll start first. I'll go first. I value kindness and I value accomplishment. What do you value? Anyone? <clears throat> start it out. Honesty and fairness. Honesty and fairness. What else? Equality. Equality. Thank you. Anyone else? Service to other people. Service to others. Compassion. Compassion. Anyone else? Go for it. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. So, so your values are, again, at the core, at the bottom, very bottom. They're the most important, and they drive your, your decisions. Uh, I, I use the word purpose, not passion here. And um, I use the word purpose and not passion for a reason. And, and um, 
in remember what I started the conversation with when I was teaching and trying to figure out how to help my students be successful. And I did some research again, uh, uh, applied psychology, and they talked about what motivates people and, and what motivates them is having a purpose, a reason, a why for, for their degree, for their major. Um, they did in the book, it's one of the, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the author and it's escaping me at this moment. Um, it'll come to me, I'll share it. Uh, but they did an experiment where they offered to um, give somebody like $50 to donate blood. And some people donated blood. But in another, in the other part of the experiment, they offered or they shared that somebody's in the hospital and you may be saving their life by donating blood. We don't know for sure, but that's the situation. A lot more people donated blood than um, when, when they gave them the $20. Having a purpose, a bigger purpose that involves service to others um, is important in driving your success and persistence in college. Uh, let's see. And by the way, like life purpose doesn't have to be like there's this misconception that has to be this grand thing that I'm going to solve the water problem for the world or I'm going to cure cancer. Those are great ideas. If that's what's driving you and working for you, go for it. But it doesn't have to be that big. When you're when you're starting and you can't you know pay for a decent lunch, your life purpose maybe to become you know financially independent. And that is okay, you know, because you can't help others if you can't help yourself. Uh, it's okay to, to work to stand on your own feet or help your family. And so it doesn't have to be huge. And then from that purpose, okay, so uh, hypothetically. Uh, my purpose is to get a college degree where I'm able to make $60,000 a year, right? And so in the most immediate thing is to make sure I'm able to be successful in my classes. And therefore, I am going to cut my hours at work from 30 hours a week to 20 hours a week and save and not spend on whatever it is whatever luxury item, like, and I say this with complete, like, um, understanding and empathy, because, again, there's so much pressure on people to live the lifestyle, but I also can say that I, you know, we started from nothing, <laughs> we know nothing, and I know what it's like to have nothing and have to work and save every penny, and, and so there's always a way so focus on your purpose. What is your goal? Reduce the hours for now so I can make it focus on my education, make it through college. Once you have that goal, um, that will, will uh, then you, you move to the survey. And I want to give a plug to your college counselors. Your college counselors can be your best friend. They are the best thing in the world because they can guide you through the next um, phase of this model, which is what jobs, when, once you figure out what you want to do, given your purpose, give me the job that, that um, is a match with my natural talents, give me a job that is in a growth industry, and give me the job that is in my, um, in my uh, lifestyle matches. Let me elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, my natural talents, again, you can try all you want to get me, Kathy, to you know not ask questions. It's gonna be hard. <laughs> I am just a person who just asks questions and seeking knowledge, and that's how I'm here today. When I was 17 years old, my, my relatives and cousins and brothers and sisters were not able to find work because the economy in Jordan was in the dumps because uh, the US economy was struggling back in 1981. And I wanted to figure out how do I, how, how does an, a growth economy work? How do you build a, a robust economy so people can do the right thing, go to college and get a job? So that started me on a search with questions of how do you build an economy? At 17 years old, and that's how I ended up in economics. My father tried to tell me go into accounting. I thought, no, Dad, I don't want to get into accounting. It would have been better to, you know, in terms of pay. Um, 
but look at me now, like again, going with the detour. I had three kids. The purpose was to be co committed to them, to take care of my kids. I selected a career path, which fulfills my soul of learning and um, allows me to be with them. I did that and then I got curious, asking questions. Okay, what, like outside of the classroom, how does this work being in administration? How does the college work? How does it connect to the government operations and the state and the funding and all that good stuff? Asking questions. So, and now I was over the years asking questions. How do I help my students be successful? And that's how I am here. So that is core to who I am. And you got to find out what's core to yours. Um, that's your natural talent, oops, uh, natural talents, the stuff that you can't help but do. Uh, growth industries. This is so cool because, again, in economics, I used to tell my students um, the economy is like a wheel, and the wheel is always moving forward, it doesn't go backwards. You can get on a, an industry on the wheel that is declining and spend the rest of your life struggling to get ahead because every time you move up, then they pull you back down. Or you can get into an industry that's expanding and take your career. And, and so that takes care of the element of, okay, what industry should I get into? And there is, there is a way to find a match. And this is where your counselors will be very helpful because they can find you those um, areas where the like highest growth, by the way, now the highest growth industries are um, healthcare and um, the data, all information, technology, uh, digital media, because of all the media, social media that you see and, and the communication via you know, electronic. And uh, manufacturing is coming back to the United States, as a matter of fact, um, bio um, technology and biomanufacturing is huge and it's gonna continue to be huge in the coming years because um, the baby boomers every day, listen to this, every day, 10,000 people reach the age of 65. And guess what? We, we fall apart as we get older <laughs> and we need healthcare. And so biotechnology, how do we help them is a huge growth industry. And then uh, the, here's an important piece. Most, a lot of times people miss this part. Uh, it is so important because again, this is where not being reckless comes in. If you can't contain yourself to a space and be by yourself, you shouldn't be probably in programming <laughs> because uh, you know, you're gonna be sitting with a computer for many hours and nobody to speak with as you code. And, and so pick, things that um, give you the lifestyle that you that you need. If you're an outdoors person, maybe you know sports would, would be a better match. And so again, the counselors would be able to help you with these questions. Um, I, I covered the topic on the purpose um, and then the family. And, and again, this is important. Can anyone share with us um, how um, they're engaged or not engaged with their family on the conversation of what should I do with my life? What should I major in? What career should I get into? Who, who's engaged, who's not? Go for it. Um, so right now my plan is to work on my Mm -hmm. And my dad, he actually currently works within LUSD as an assistant teacher. So he's been helpful for me seeing like what's available within the district as I get older and start my career, seeing what the pay is going to be. I think all those aspects of it, like what's needed, what degrees. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Anyone else cares to share? Are you do you feel the pressure that I gotta figure this out on my own? I'm seeing people shake their heads. Yeah. So and again, I want to also touch on the idea that you know Western versus Eastern perspective, the Western perspective, you know, get your head in the game, figure out your stuff. I can't help you do your research, you're on your own, this is your choice, versus the Eastern perspective is you know talk about it or I don't think you should do this don't do this 
<laughs> because you know, some sometimes that it's like you cannot. I I I uh, I refuse to allow you to do that. And and so I it's the, it's important to know where you're at and navigate it. And it takes skill, ladies and gentlemen, because there's value in engaging your family. There's value in engaging your family. As a matter of fact, the research uh, says that. Um, 30% of students' decisions are based on family advice. You know, at the end of the day, with all the talk about being independent and the research and the media and all that stuff, family still contributes. And remember, 250 years ago, you were attached to your mom's skirt <laughs> until you were seven years old. So it's not, not normal to be close to your family to engage them. And if you have anxiety, tell them. I, you know, I'm worried about this. Mom, dad, whatever, uncle, and grandpa, grandpa. I'm worried about this. What do you think of it? Come up with ways to have a conversation. You know, I was thinking, I was reading this thing, and or I attended this workshop or a lecture, and they told us X, Y, Z. What do you think? So find ways to engage them and tap into their experiences. And so, um, Here's an exercise. I'm mean, we're not going to be able to do it here, but it's so valuable. As a matter of fact, I borrowed this exercise from a book um, on life, designing your life, using design principles to figure out what to do with your life. And how cool is that? It doesn't get cooler than that. The, the class is offered, I believe, at either Harvard or Yale, and it is the top enrolling class from the whole college. And they wrote the, the authors wrote a book, and they're on YouTube, by the way. And this is the exercise. Um, think of three to five situations, five is better, and and or maybe track yourself over two, three week period, where you know you thought, okay, I, you're in your group, you got this. People told you, for example, you're so good at this, you're you're a natural. Um, so think of those situations. Ask yourself. What was I doing? What was the setting? What were some tools I was using? How, what I was I working with others or working by myself? What, what abilities, what natural abilities was I using during those situations? Look for a pattern, because that will tell you, you know, what's working for you, what are your natural talents and um, Again, use it to define next steps. Ask your parents and teachers, and again, talk to your counselor. Uh, how many people here used um, Myers-Briggs, uh, Cooter Journey, Strength Finder, or any of this assessment? Yes, please, which one did you use? Um, I've done Myers-Briggs, but for current counseling here, I did the Cooter Journey. Okay, it's excellent. Anyone else? If you have not heard of those, if you have not talked to your counselor, uh, I just, um, I don't know if I shared with some of the people here or not, my niece, uh, <laughs> she's 18 years old, she just graduated last June, she wanted to go st uh, study abroad or no, to out of state, to University of Washington, uh, undeclared, her father said, you know what, I'm not going to spend $100,000 to go undeclared, why don't you go to a community college, I told him, he called me and said, okay, this is what's going on, what do I do, I said, have her speak with a counselor. Do the assessment, come up with an ed plan. And she did. And she's so excited now. Even though she's got she she feels like she's left out all her friends out in out of state or big name universities, and there's this whole competition. Now she's excited because she's trying or figuring herself out, and the counselors help her with it. And again, the topic of passions. Um, what if I don't have one? What do I do with myself? Like, I'm passionate about, uh, you know, uh, sports cards, you know, those little sports cards, like my son knows, <laughs> grandson, I should say, um, he's starting to collect them. Could, should I, should I make, that, make that my college, uh, you know, major? How, how does that work? And, and so you don't have to struggle with, with this question, I feel. Um, you don't have to struggle with this question anymore. Um, because, because if you follow the model, the model will lead you. Uh, if, if you know your passion, you want to run with it, and you, you have the right career, go for it. But you don't have to, to find that one passion. The other thing, here's another story. 
I told you I collected this over the years. Um, when we were, I was going through my doctor's program, they shared with us the story of a National Geographic photographer. His, his first name is David, I can't remember his last name. Uh, name. You again, on YouTube. Um, he won like the world prize of photography. They asked him, how, how did you improve your skill as a photographer to win that shot, to capture that shot? And essentially, he told them the story or the myth of somebody in Italy and how do you build a cathedral? You build it one stone at a time. There's a lot of hard work, slowly, a little bit at a time. You build your skills. You struggle in the beginning until you hit the mastery level. At the mastery level, you start to have fun. Can I make a confession? I am feeling, personally, I am feeling, I am just now at age 56, having worked and taught for uh, 20 years and administrator for um, 10 more. Now I'm having the most in my life doing what I do because um, I am reaching that mastery. Like at each level there was joy and there was hard work. Well, in the beginning, lots of hard work. In general education, you're scratching the surface. You're taking a lot of information in, hard work, patience. But you get to the mastery level, fun gets there. Um, going on here, um, we covered some of these topics like, um, you know, what you cannot not do. You, you just can't stop yourself from doing. And then uh, in the beginning, it, it's always hard. I'm going to share this example. A counselor here at TOC shared it with me. Uh, she said she was helping a student who didn't know what they wanted to do. She, they saw a crime scene investigation and they thought, I need to get into the administration of justice program. So she did the cooter journey and the, did the assessment. And based on her conversation, with this huge conversation and assessment with him, it turned out that what was you know, matching for him was actually anatomy and physiology and taking like blood classes to get into uh, then uh, you know, blood and how, like, when you hit the blood and how it splatters and all that stuff. That's what happens in, in the things that he was interested in. And so, if you don't talk to a counselor, you might make a wrong assumption about the matching major to your future career. The other thing I want to touch on is like, okay, you know, like I told my mom I want to major in history and she laughed at me. Ladies and gentlemen, every, every path. If you connect it with your right, with your right and uh, natural uh, talents, you you will um, you will find the right job and you will be able to make a, a, a living. Is there a way to connect um, history to data science? Like, look at what's going on now. For example, with the elections for the past um, ten days or so, and all you know, all these conversations like. Um, when we verify what we think happened, how can you verify it? How can you use a computing power to do that? Psychology. Psychology, probably one of the most important majors anybody can get into along with something else is psychology. Because until you understand yourself and understand people, you're even if you have the most advanced degree in anything, you have to be able to work with people and get along with them, work with your family, with your children, with, with your friends. And that guess what? Psychology teaches you how to do that. So with that, uh, you identify the, I gave you an example here. You identify the your natural talents, careers in natural talents, career in lifestyle, career in the growth industry. And you might find, oh, maybe teaching is what I need to do, or maybe writing or blogging or whatever it is. And so finding that common ground, common intersection point uh, is so important. And uh, let's see. So in conclusion, I want to say that you're going to be OK. You can, it, can, it can be fun. Make it a journey, exciting. Uh, we live in a um, fortunate time. We get to experience all these things. And uh, I know it gets hard sometimes, but it really, you know, it's so exciting to be alive today. It's so exciting. We get to see and experience so many things. 
that people 200 years ago didn't get to experience. And, and so in the process of having fun with it, uh, help someone um, along the way, and that will take care of things. It'd be fun. Cool? Any questions, comments, thoughts? Have any questions or comments? Please uh, raise your hand, and I'll read the mic. This is not a karaoke mic. We don't have to sing, <laughs> but we just want to have this focus. I thought that what you said about um, thirty percent—I think you said thirty percent of students make a decision based on peer and family. Yes. Yeah, I think it might even be greater than that now, but. Uh, in research on, and I, I know there's a lot for domestic students in the United States, but it's also the Eastern cultures and, and you know, research on international students found that almost every single student had family or peer pressure, which led them to study outside the United States. It wasn't just something that they wanted in the back. They had to have that or they didn't need to pursue it. So international students have an even greater uh, so collective um, pressure to succeed and make that decision, pick a major and find that job and things like that. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all because uh, I I grew up in an Eastern culture where like everything you do um, has to be vetted and stamped by the family. And so it's not easy and um, you just, I feel that ultimately, you can you can make initially small decisions along the way to pave the path, the path for that core that a bottle pick <laughs> to come out because and it's small like my goodness if I tell you my story and my struggles like when I wanted to enroll in the first economics classes at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, after I got my TOEFL exam, you know, score passing, um, the question was, is like, are you going to be able to, to take those classes? Are you going to be able to handle the baby and, and go to school? Why don't you postpone it another um, semester, you know? So doubt is going to be all over you. And it's, and, and I, did, I, I didn't set out at that time. I was only 20 years old. I didn't set out to here, I just needed to take one small action towards that core. And so that having, keeping that going small incrementally will get you to a different place. It's going to take time. It's not like being in the States for sure. Or Western culture generally. Yes, please. It's coming. Right here. Cool. From our Zoom audience. Oh, or not a question. Um, Alicia Kaminsky, who is one of CUC's group counselors, I've seen her myself and she's very helpful. Uh, she says, I want to share that you do not need to go to Harvard to take a life planning course. Here at CUC, we have Counseling 110 Life and Career Plan. Yep, yeah, I agree a thousand percent. Anyone else? Questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for your time and for listening. I appreciate you. I saw uh, someone online waiting. Oh, that one more Alicia. Alicia, okay. Any, any other comments, questions? Uh, any feedback? Did you, did you find this helpful? Yeah, very. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For all the information. That was really great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, okay. okay. Uh, let's uh, take the speaker again. Have a good day, everyone.